Hi there and welcome to the second sub-module about how the corona crisis impacts the economy in unequal societies. Now, we will focus on our second learning goal, and that is that at the end of this sub-module you should be able to explain to others how inequality interacts with the economic effects of lockdowns. To master this learning goal, we shall divide the subject of our sub-module into two parts. First, we discuss the economic effects of COVID-19 in general, and second, we discuss how inequality interacts with these effects. Let's have a look at the economic implications of COVID-19 first. Since we are talking about a very new pandemic and a coordinated lockdown the likes of which the world has never seen before, the economic insights are still coming in. And our primary sources have to be both recent academic studies as well as studies that study the impact of previous pandemics. When it comes to the economic impact, Carlson, Slezak and co-authors make a distinction between three different types of impact. The first is a direct hit to consumer confidence that translates to a reduced demand for consumption of services and goods. This is a direct channel because the drop in demand is a direct consequence of the virus and the associated lockdown policies. The second impact is an indirect impact and it comes through changes in financial assets. For example, if the virus reduces the values of people's houses and stocks in the stock market, they will probably reduce their consumption to make up for that loss of wealth. The third impact comes not from demand but rather from supply side disruption. For example, when the lockdown started in China, some factories were shut down and thus couldn't produce enough goods to meet demand. Not only did this affect the supply of these particular goods, it also had a major impact on other companies and countries because of supply chain disruptions. This means that, for example, a computer company in America couldn't deliver its computers because its chip manufacturing facilities in China were shut down. All of these negative impacts make it very likely that lockdown policies, and even if people stop doing these activities out of their own free will because they don't want to get sick, will cause a severe economic downturn. Now, besides implementing lockdown policies to stop or slow down the virus, the government also has a host of policies at its disposal to mitigate the economic damage that both lockdowns and the virus can cause. These can be roughly divided into three categories. First and foremost, there's fiscal policy. This is referring to the government spending more to offset the reduced spending by people and businesses. This comes in two forms. First, automatic transfers, which are fiscal policies that are already in place and that will activate once the economy hits a recession. Think about, for example, unemployment benefits, which will automatically become more pronounced when more people become unemployed. And the second part of fiscal policies are targeted stimulus measures, which are specifically designed for this crisis and target the negative effects of the pandemic directly. Think about emergency loans for small businesses in the hospitality sector or compensation for businesses that have had to close down. The second type of policy measures are not done by the government directly, but rather by the central bank. These policies are often known as monetary policies, since they concern the creation or encouragement of the creation of money. In this crisis, the two most common central bank responses have been interest rate decreases or asset purchases, and the latter is also known as quantitative easing or QE for short. The idea of monetary policy has been to lighten the load for borrowers, to prevent a lending stop, and also to prevent a large drop in asset prices that would have impacted the economy via the indirect channel that we discussed previously. Finally, there are other regulatory measures that do not directly cost the government money. Think about the government providing loan guarantees, which only become costly if these businesses go out of business or letting companies postpone their tax payments. This really helps those companies who are short on cash now, 
but it doesn't mean that their taxes will not be paid after the pandemic is over. Luckily, economic downturns like pandemics cannot last forever, especially not when the government has had effective policies in place. Therefore, at some point, there is likely to be a recovery. Now, then the question is, what would such a recovery look like? Economists generally talk about three types of recovery. The first is the best, and that is a V-shaped recovery. It means that after a rapid decline, an equally rapid rebound happens. This is a pattern that was often observed with other pandemics. That being said, this pandemic is way more severe than others, and the world was drowning in private and public debt when it started. So the current economic impact could very well be worse. One scenario that is worse is known as the U-shaped recovery. It means that economic growth drops rapidly and then stays low for quite some time before it recovers. Finally, an even worse scenario is that of an L-shaped recovery. That means that the economy will never really recover to its former glory. Finally, more and more economists have been talking about a K-shaped recovery. This means a V-shaped recovery for the rich and a continuing decline for the poor. Now, why would that be a realistic scenario? Let's list a couple of reasons. First of all, those most hit by the lockdowns are those workers who cannot work from home. Typically, these are poorer, less educated workers. Second, whereas workers in formal sectors have employment protection and are thus less likely to immediately lose their jobs, informal sector workers have no employment protection whatsoever and thus are much more likely to get fired. Third, poorer people are generally more reliant on public transport than those who are rich enough to own a car. Thus, poor people might be particularly hard hit by a public transport ban or might get sick while using public transport and lose their job because of it. Another reason why the poor suffer more is that they have smaller buffers. For example, most large businesses have the reserves to survive a longer period of time with little to no income, while small businesses might not have these buffers and will go out of business. Once the economy then picks up, they are no longer in a position to compete with larger businesses. Note that there is no consensus on this yet. There might also be reasons as to why the pandemic decreases inequality, especially since the poorest people can only lose so much money, whereas the rich have more to lose. In the past, some catastrophic events such as wars have made societies more equal, economically speaking, even though it was at a terrible cost. But so far, most research seems to focus on the inequality increasing aspects of this pandemic. Finally, also note that if the poor suffer more than the rich, this is generally bad for the economy because poor people tend to spend more of their income than the wealthy. This brings us back to the relief policies in unequal societies. Let's focus on fiscal policies first. Many fiscal policies are often aimed explicitly at smaller companies and lower income workers and thus at reducing inequality. Schemes that compensate employees also often have an income cap on them, thus benefiting the poor more than the rich. Furthermore, automatic stabilizers like unemployment benefits in general also have income caps. Thus, they benefit the poor more than the rich. However, in many unequal countries, corruption by the elite is a big, big problem. Thus, in some schemes, Money might have been intended for the poor, but ended up with a well-connected elite. This indeed happened in South Africa, where food and other relief for the poorest of the poor inexplicably ended up in the hands of ruling party family members. Also, even without corruption, small businesses tend to have more trouble getting access to government funding and schemes. Big companies often have the lawyers and sometimes even political connections to be able to benefit from government subsidies. This means that they and their owners, generally the rich, might benefit more from these measures than the poor, despite their initial good intentions. Sadly, monetary policy is more likely than fiscal policy to benefit the rich because it raises asset prices and those assets are typically owned by those who are already wealthy. Finally, credit guarantees and other measures are also often easier to access by the rich. 
After all, a credit guarantee to a fairly wealthy company is way less risky than to a very fragile company. So whether policies offset or amplify the increased inequality because of a pandemic depends on the mix of policies being used and on how effective the government is at making sure that the relief intended for the poor actually ends up with the poor. The jury is still out on which countries have managed to do this successfully. Having discussed how inequality interacts with the economic effects of lockdown, please ask yourself, are you now able to explain this to others? If you can, you have mastered its learning goal. If not, please go through the course materials until you feel confident that you can do so.